when productivity per unit of labor goes up, mm -hmm. okay, what does that mean from an employer's perspective, right? If I'm hiring people and I can now get double the production out of You're a worker. You're hiring less people. Right. I can hire half as many people to produce the same amount. Right. Okay. So what you see is the number of jobs declines as productivity goes up. There's, now, so there's more competition for those higher paying jobs. Well, they're not necessarily higher paying jobs, just the jobs that remain. True. Right? You have more people competing for the jobs that are left, which means higher supply of labor and lower number of jobs. So you don't have to jobs. pay people as Correct. much because right. everyone's fighting for those jobs. Correct. All right. As fast as we can get into the music so we don't have to listen to it. This is the True Well Show, the great, the best Tuesday you've had all week. I'm your host, <laughs> I Abraham John, today in studio. <laughs> Matt now, Dixon. It is my yes. favorite Tuesday all week. Really? Yes. Okay. I love it. Uh, also, the last Tuesday of April. So, goodbye, April. You've been good. Welcome, May. I feel like 2024 is just ripping by. It really is. So, you know, we're in Q2. Like, we're like a third of the way through Q2 already. Well, the market has been pretty nice to us so far. It has. Yeah, that's felt good. So here's the real question, right? Do you sell in May and go away? Hmm. I you mean, know. I don't know what the numbers are year to date, but... Solid. It's it's Solid. all run. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't have the answer either. If you're looking for the answer, we can check the crystal ball, and it says... Oh, I don't even have one with me. Hmm. So it's what it says is, go get your own crystal ball. Uh, we do not try to play that game on this show, as you guys know. Because somebody will take us seriously and then blame us. So we're not going to play the blame game. Instead, we're going to play the let's learn together game. What um, are we learning about? Okay. This is one of these uh, strange ones. It's, it's probably started with an observation and a handful of statements, and now it's blossomed into, we just want to talk about this. Okay. All right. The question is, what does it take to get ahead today? Well, I saw something interesting coming into the show. We, I mean, You saw it too. Yep. There's this interesting Google search going around right now. Okay, talk uh, to me about yeah. the Google search. And people are saying, you know, is $700,000 enough to retire? And apparently that's one of the most popular, you know, searches right now on Google. Right. And can you help? Uh, so... We did a little reverse engineering, like a little did. snooping around, like, where did you come up with this number? Yeah, I really wanted to know. So yeah. I, I started prodding around on the internet, and apparently it's because people are kind of focused around, well, I think I might be able to live, or live on $40,000 a year, mm -hmm. and with you know trying to live 25 years in retirement, and having that kind of safe withdrawal rate around 4%, that works out to be about $700,000 that you could draw on for 25 years All right. to live on about $40,000 So a we got to talk for a minute about the 4% rule. Do you okay. want to kind of go into what that means? Sure, sure. Yeah. And, and just so everybody's aware, right? 4% rule is kind of like pirate code, right? It's guidelines, right? It's mm -hmm. not a guarantee on this thing here. But right, because we don't know what the markets are going to do. Yeah, we don't yeah. Know what we're we're trying do. to predict the future. But if you're kind of looking in the, in the rearview mirror, that what the four percent rule tells us is that historically speaking, if you were to take four percent of the value of your nest egg out each year, and you were to fix it at four percent, so the market goes up, you get a little bit more. The market goes down, you get a little bit less. But that the probability that that money would last 30 years or longer is extremely high. Not quite 100%, but very high. Right. So that has been traditionally viewed as sort of the safe withdrawal rate. Okay. And I air quotes safe. You got an air quote on the radio, right? Super useful. You don't want to get sued. Right. So anyway, that's been sort of financial advisor shorthand for a long time. It's just say, well, 4%, it's 30 years in retirement. So it kind of does make sense that the 700,000 are right, well, that's 40 grand a year, roughly. Now, what can impact that? Sequence of returns, right? Yeah. You get several bad years right out of the gate. Well, and we've a had a wild roller coaster ride. We saw 2022 markets were down, or that was, we were up, what, 20%, and then 2023 down 20% or so, mm -hmm. and then now we were up maybe like 8 or 9% to start yeah, the year. Yeah. Yeah, I don't even know. The numbers fluctuate so fast. But right. And it, I have to recall, big, too, yeah, I think the catch on the 4% rule, I think the reason the math has a catch to it, if you just took 4% out every year, 
that ought to last in perpetuity, right? Because, right, 4%, well, even today's if it, 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 well, it might keep shrinking, right? Oh, the account went down, I pulled 4% out. Now I take 4% of the smaller number out. You just keep taking 4% out, you don't run out of money because you'll just take a smaller and smaller amount. It's that but the whole, catch yeah. is you don't go backwards, right? If the markets go up, you can increase your 4% for inflation adjustment, but if the markets go down, you sustain the original 4%. But that's where the gotcha is. If you go through a series of negative years, it can sneak up on you. And all of a sudden you've discovered that you've taken so much out that you can't dig back out of the hole. Like you need, the rate of return is too high to fill the bucket back up after you've taken that much of an of right, withdrawal because out. fixed expenses, you gotta have enough money to live on. And that's where you're saying it can get dangerous. It's like- That's it, it's, that's why they're not guarantees, but they are statistically really high probability, high enough that it's been historically used as like, hey, you know, you're probably gonna make it 30 years with this strategy, or potentially, if you have a good sequence of returns, indefinite, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you end up with more, you, you die with more than you started because the sequence of returns rewards you and it just keeps going. So it kind of, you know, it's, it's a very swag estimate, but it's, it, so, Suffice it to say, it's kind of driving this research online, right? People are mm -hmm. looking at this going, hey, you know, 700 grand, can, does that get me 40 grand a year? And if, you know, in the event that you're looking at your own personal finances and you're saying, uh, well, I have this amount and my lifestyle looks like this, do I have enough money for me to live comfortably? I think that's one of the areas that a financial advisor can be really useful is in helping you because, I mean, right, like we as a firm, we pay for software that helps us analyze that. And I think a lot of people, that's kind of what they're looking for. You know, I yeah. want to know that I'm comfortable and I want to know that, you know, things are okay. Now, does the software, is it able to tell you with 100% certainty? Well, don't, not, no. nothing is, no. but, but it can, it does probability analysis in addition to math, right? Exactly. That's the key to it yeah. is, uh, if, if you want to go online and, you know, figure out a, kind of a, a simple calculator that says, well, if you earn this much per year and you spend this much per year and that works out long term, this is how long the money lasts. And you kind of see when you run out of money because it's pretty straightforward math. The problem is the variability, right? What happens when it's not a consistent rate of return? Here's another big variable. What if you have a really large expense you know is coming and that is gonna change your financial picture too. Yeah, or here's an even additional variable. What if we change tax policy, right? And so exactly, mm -hmm. all right, well that'll throw it off too. So the idea is that you run a, a whole battery of different variables, you plot the outcomes, and then you look at the distribution of outcomes with those randomized variables and say, well, here we can kind of develop some statistical samples and give you a sense of whether or not it's likely Right? You're saying, well, 95% of the time it works out. That's pretty high probability. But if it's like, well, 16% of the time it works, but the other, you know, 84% of the time it doesn't, you go, that is not probably a plan that you want to really bank on because there's a lot higher chance of it not working than it actually working. Right? Too many yeah. things have to go right in order for that to play out versus the conservative approach is, well, what if a bunch of stuff went wrong? Does it still work? Mm hmm. I mean, do you have, you've been doing this a long time. Do you have any, you know, stories maybe of like where you've gotten into a financial plan or you've started really looking at the numbers and you've maybe even been surprised by what you found? Has there ever been an instance where you're like, I really didn't expect the numbers to say this, but here's a story I didn't really expect to see? Well, sure. I mean, I think that there's, there's stories that have been both positive and, and negative. Right? Okay. Uh, positive stories tend to be people like forgetting variables. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, I assumed it was something like this, and I didn't know this was going to happen. Well, I've had that happen. Um, I had a meeting where someone, you know, kind of diagrammed everything that they had going on, and they're like, "Oh, you know, I was really hoping to be able to spend a little bit more in retirement." And then they throw in a, a curveball where they're like, "Oh, by the way, I've got a hundred thousand dollars of physical gold." And I'm like, "Well, that changes things. You know, if you want a certain lifestyle and you don't feel like you can have it now, have you thought about spending some gold, like?" cashing that in and, and using that asset. Right, and I've had situations where uh, folks forgot about a pension. Really? Yeah, like, you know, it's, like, it's like, oh, it's sat there, and then, well, I gotta do this, that, and the other, and I'm gonna run out of money, and they go, well, but but there's also this, and uh, and and I'm getting Social Security, or, but I also have my military disability, or something, mm -hmm. you know. You, you gotta include that in the data point, because that is 
going into the cost of living kitty right there. And so those are happy surprises when it's like, oh, there was more there than I realized. I wonder right. how many times heirs, like, you know, there's an estate, someone passes away, and then there was an asset that was completely forgotten about in the mix of things. And then it's like, surprise, there was this other thing that even the person who owned it completely forgot about. Yeah, well, or just inheritance in general. That's sometimes a surprise too, is that people, well, I never counted on it. And then lo and behold, there was this inheritance and it kind of changed the game. Uh, you know, and I, I, we, I talk all the time to people about, well, I know it's morbid to count on an inheritance, but it's relevant. It right. Is. So especially if you're on the bubble and you're likely to receive an inheritance, then you know, there may be some planning strategies that you want to deploy to improve the probability. Uh, here's a real life example. Like this, you're asking for, here's a scenario. Sure. Okay. Had a couple where it was a his and hers, okay? And she was going to receive an inheritance, but he wasn't. The inheritance was the what made the financial plan go. But if she went before him, the inheritance went with her. So his plan didn't work without her. So what do you do? You buy insurance on her. And once the inheritance shows up, you can let the insurance you can, go. You can lap. You can yeah. Let you the allow the insurance to because you're just renting the insurance to cover that risk. That's ingenious. Yeah, so that's that was a, a real life financial planning case that uh, I have used before because the inheritance was relevant, right? And so yeah. And and so that that's a just kind of an example of how planning is a lot more than investing. Was this a plan you came up with? It was. That's cool. I like that. <laughs> yeah. So there you go. Um, one of those, you know, it's not even sleight of hand. It's just um, in the landscape of financial planning, you, 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 there's a lot of tools in the bag. Well, you and, just made sure that their plan worked for them based right. on what they needed. Well, and it's scenario based. Exactly. So what did they need? Well, they needed this set of tools. Not everybody does, right? I mean, I, it kind of bugs me when you get a product salesman that, you know, if you're a life insurance salesman, there's an expression. If the only thing you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And so all of a sudden life insurance is the Swiss army knife of financial products. Mm -hmm. like, it, it definitely has its use cases, right? And some of them can be very clever. Uh, but it's not the only tool in the bag, right? right? And I think it's important that you approach the problem solved that way. So anyway, um, slightly off the, I, I guess this is good. It sets the table for the conversation of the day around planning. But I, I want us to uh, really get an opportunity to speak to, so everybody out there listening, um, the, it's for all of you, right? But uh, a lot of our listeners are either... You know, you got kids that are almost out of the house or they're already out of the house or maybe it's grandkids at this point. And uh, but that I mean, you, that may not be you. Right. But that's a lot of folks. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I'm the, the people I'm talking to are the folks that are concerned about. Well, it might be yourself, but maybe it's those kids or grandkids and going, how are they going to make it work in this world where it seems like the hill's getting steeper or is the hill getting steeper? Right. Yeah. I'm going to make a crazy statement out there that I think the hill is getting steeper. Like, I, I think the data think suggests a lot it's of actually are more expensive. It. Yeah, I think a lot of people are feeling it, and they can't necessarily put their thumb on exactly what it is. I mean, inflation's a broad term, but what's really more of the underlying issue, I think, is what we want to get into. Yeah. Why does life feel more expensive? If you're wondering, golly, why is it so different than you know back in my day, and why does it feel so exotic? Okay. You're saying it can like, be more than just the cost of gas. Yeah, or, it's not just yeah. the cost of gas or the cost of food or the cost of housing. Those are all part of it. Okay, And it's interesting, too, because poverty rates haven't increased, and yet we're feeling a different level of strain yeah. here. Okay, I mean, since the 70s, poverty yeah. rates have floated between 10 and 15%. So, so that's not it. What else is going on? Some of it's perspective, but then I think there's something more. I want to know what that is, David. And we're going to unpack it after this break. All right, gang, welcome back to the True Wealth Radio Show. I'm your host, Dave Littlejohn, in studio with me today. Matt Dixon. And uh, I will remind everybody, we podcast this show. You can check it out on our webpage at littlejohnfs.com. And it is now available on YouTube. So if you want to subscribe to our YouTube channel, you can watch the show and you can see a lot of the footage that happens in between segments, right? So if you ever wonder like, hey, what's going on? Uh, and sometimes it's just you know, hey, I'm checking my phone, but uh, we should play more fun games on the break, like we, some we trivia. Could. 
trivia. I would, yeah, like you want the trivia portion of this thing. Yeah. You gotta tune in after class. We, we keep uh, coming up with all kinds. So uh, anyway, let's get back to, for everybody who's listening, you're like, great, are you gonna talk about what you left us at the break for or not? What, where did we leave off? Well, I Bring believe we left off, we were talking about how it's getting harder to get ahead. Yep. And, uh, or and where's it, it coming be, from? Yeah, that's the Yeah, the and so what's, what's driving this? Because the question is, what does it take to get ahead now? And uh, we thought it was interesting because we've got some data, right? Like you yeah. were doing data mining and I've been doing some reading too. Uh, first, let's talk a little bit about the backdrop here. What was some of the things that you discovered, Matt, in your research this week? Yeah, that we are right now experiencing the longest period in history where we haven't had an increase in, this is looking at the federal minimum wage, right? Yep. And it's inflation adjusting everything. So looking at kind of your purchasing power of what would minimum wage buy you back then, inflation adjusted to today. Okay. And so if you were to inflation adjust minimum wage, go back to 1968. So February of 1968, that's when we hit our peak where the federal minimum wage would be about... Like max purchasing power yeah, relative max, to minimum yeah, wage. Exactly. Okay. That would be a little over $11. Okay, if it was adjusted to if today. If it was adjusted to today, which yeah. is and federal minimum wage is lower than that. Right. Yeah, I think today we're at like 725 or right. something. So and of course the question is how many jobs are at the federal minimum wage these days? Like, very is, very few. Yeah, like does does that really exist? Is it a yeah. is it a relevant metric but anymore? But it's a baseline I think to look at where are we at as a percentage on what does today's dollars mean versus what did it mean prior? And we've experienced a really long skid. You know, that's 34% less than it was in 1968. Right. Now, for everybody listening, there are a couple things that we don't ha have the answer for yet, too, to consider. You know, one is how many states have a state minimum wage right, because that, here that, that Oregon, kind of renders yeah. federal uh, sort of, uh, you know, irrelevant. Right. Okay, so yeah, I mean, in Oregon, it's significantly more, it's higher in Portland than it is in the rest of the state. And, um, and I think there are some other implications to what right, is Right, because what is we're not just mean. talking about federal minimum wage, right? We're looking at wages really on a broader spectrum and saying, if the minimum wage is tracking on this scale, what are the other wages tracking? And I think that's kind of some of the more in-depth statistics I want to look at in saying, how are wages keeping up with Different things like productivity and, you know, uh, a this lot one is sticking in Matthew's craw, by the way. It is. This, this productivity thing. So just lay it out there because uh, I'm going to have fun punching holes in this. Okay. So since 1973 to 2013, so this is a little older data, right? So we've got a 10 year gap here to make this current. But between those years, productivity was up 74%, but the hourly compensation was only up 9%. So you are getting a lot more production from your employees, but the, the hourly compensation didn't match that. You go backwards in time to 1948, run that to 1973, it was almost step for step matching each other. Productivity between those years, 1948 to 1973, up 96% on productivity mm -hmm. and hourly compensation up 91%. percent mm hmm so what we witnessed was a huge gap after that 19, you know, the, the mid 1970s, we mm -hmm. watched wages not keep up with productivity. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's interesting when you start to really get into the numbers on this. Now, here's a fun fact. Okay. When did we go off the gold standard? Right about that time. 1971. Yeah. Right? I was noticing that and I wondered if there was a correlation. Well, here's another fun fact. Okay. What have we been doing fairly consistently post World War II and really specifically from the 70s forward? We've been importing a lot more, but we've had our manufacturing exported overseas, right? Made in China, the made trade in Taiwan. Balance made in China. really changed, is what you're saying. Right. Yeah. And so if you consider the fact that, uh, all of a sudden, we globalized the labor market. It changed the price of labor domestically relative to over the pond, if you will. Hmm. So you needed 
productivity to increase per worker because otherwise it became cost competitive to ship the jobs overseas and bring the product back completed. Right. Right. This is the Nike phenomenon. It drives everybody nuts that you know Nike has a bunch of their shoes made in Vietnam. Right. And then or at least I believe last time. Right. It was but Vietnam. would you pay three or well Yeah, would you pay five, six, seven hundred dollars or you know, you're still paying a lot and Nike's making a real premium, right? They're they're paying much less than that to manufacture the shoe. But the argument is, well, why do they do that? Presumably because it's much cheaper to manufacture the shoes there than here in the United States. Right. Now, whether that's right, wrong, or otherwise isn't the comment of the day. Nope. It is, what does that do to the cost of labor? Right. Right? Because you're now having to compete as a labor force across the pond. A lot more workers entered the workforce, too. Yeah, that's that's the the larger issue here. See, I think that there's something else at play that if we could better understand this, and I say we, meaning if, if I was trying to teach more people about this, to understand how wealth gets created and how the middle class falls behind, right? I think if we could understand this better, it gives folks a more of a fighting chance at keeping up. Right, and I think that's really the goal. We're trying to empower people. How do you get ahead? Yeah. Yeah. So, but, but first you got to have an understanding, right? So one of them is uh, when productivity per unit of labor goes up, mm -hmm. okay, what does that mean from an employer's perspective, right? If I'm hiring people and I can now get double the production out of You're a worker. You're hiring less people. Right. I can hire half as many people to produce the same amount. Right. Okay. So what you see is the number of jobs declines as productivity goes up. There's, now, so there's more competition for those higher paying jobs. Well, they're not necessarily higher paying jobs, just the jobs that remain. True. Right? You have more people competing for the jobs that are left, which means higher supply of labor and lower number of jobs. So you don't have to jobs. pay people as Correct. much because right? everyone's fighting for those jobs. Correct. Mm -hmm. This is why we talk about scarcity being one of the components to driving up value, right? Because... When things are really scarce, you end up having to pay a premium to get it, okay? But when there's not that many jobs and a lot of people are competing for them, then you can say, well, it's like a reverse option, right? Or sorry, reverse auction, okay? Like when everybody's competing for one thing and there's lots of buyers, the price goes up. But when there's lots of buy sellers of their labor and nobody's buying it, what happens? You have to start lowering to, and so this is the idea of like somebody bidding a job and the lowest bidder wins. Right? That's really what's going on. It's the employer saying, I have a position and we're willing to fill it. Well, you do it for this little. Mm -hmm. okay? And most people don't like to think of it that way. They think, well, that's wrong of the employer. And that seems like it just depends on where you reality. land. Well, that's kind of my larger point, right? Is that we could sit here and sort of demonize employers as, well, that's dehumanizing and everybody's you know, screwing everybody else. Or we could say, well, there are natural forces at play in the market, and this is one of the consequences of globalization, right? And we do some things to normalize it, like tariffs and so forth. And we, you know, in, in certain cases, we do flat out uh, like sanctions on countries. We're like, well, we're not going to play nice with you anymore. Go ask Russia. So right? I think part of this is, you know, starting to look at why did we get here? People really quit caring about quality. Well, I, I you know, uh, I would argue that because, you know, <laughs> As you know, prices of there's price and substitution, right? Yeah. Uh, there's the the issue We're comes throw, down turned to into a throwaway generation, though. You look at someone like my grandparents' age; they were the type of people that valued quality and they didn't throw things away, right? They would repurpose. Well, did they have the same set of options? That's the question, too. That's all. That and is so, a good question. Uh, I get your point, right? Yeah. I guess I'm I'm usually. I try to be slow to make the, um, generalizations about, like, well, I, I, I ask myself, why has stuff gone overseas? Everyone wants to say, well, we need stuff made in America. It's like, well, as a culture, we have driven the demand overseas because we want cheaper products. Well, yeah, I mean, we're, that's, that's part of the, what's snuck in there is the impression of what a middle class standard of living is has gone up, right? It has. Houses are bigger. People want vacations. They want nicer cars. It is standard that people have a smartphone in their hand and broadband internet, right? These are all things that have become expectations. So there has been an expansion of lifestyle expectation, mm -hmm. even if it's hard to reach. 
Okay. The American dream has but, grown to a more expensive level. Well, we've also had policy creep. Okay, so policy creep. Let, let, let me be really that. clear. I'm not trying to throw anybody under the bus when I talk about this. I'm just going to talk about how policy creep sneaks in. Let's say that you have uh, employees that form a union. Okay, there, there's rights to do that, and there's oftentimes good reasons to do so. But the union then limits the amount of productivity that a, a person is allowed to produce for the business. And they say, this is the capitation on what we will produce. Like at the docks, this is the throughput. This is the number of units that You're we allow through. You're saying they cap their production out. They cap yeah. the production, yeah. which in, in essence constrains the labor market artificially, right? So this isn't a capitalist feature, right? This is a, um, it's, it's a free-ish market. There's still components that are free, but then there are components that are not. Layer enough of those ish components into a marketplace and you start to get sluggish in certain areas and you start to drive costs and imbalances. Especially when the government starts to meddle in free enterprise. Well, and, and that's a big portion of it is, I think whether it was intentional or not, the government is in a position where it's oftentimes competing with the private sector, and it creates an imbalance that looks less capitalistic, which means you get less ability. So you start price fixing, and that breaks things, right? So one of the solutions is, well, if we can't control the price of labor domestically, send it somewhere else where there's lower cost of regulation, mm -hmm. and then bring the product back because it actually is economically viable. Right. Right. And I don't know that that's a quality statement as much as a we can't sell enough items at this labor unit price to make it work. Now, certain areas uh, like like uh, let's use dock working as an example. I, I don't know much about it. Right. So I, I you know, I'm kind of just talking generically about this, but you kind of have to go through the port. Right. If you're shipping stuff over, it's yeah. going through. So they can constrain the, the productivity. And that simply becomes a cost of doing business, and it drives the price up, right? Because right. if you if you reduce productivity artificially, it does drive the price up, because there's they they have a monopoly on the dock, right? You have to go through them, okay? And so that's the issue. It's kind of like power companies. It's like, well, you can't go negotiate your power bill, right? You get what they tell you because it's a monopoly on who's providing it, or or it's very very small oligopoly of providers, right? And the government's kind of involved in the price structure too. Right, because they approve the yeah. price increase. So these aren't really free capital markets. And I get that we don't necessarily want completely free markets. I know that sounds crazy to have a, a you know capitalist guy like me on here say that. But unrestrained capitalism moves toward monopolies, mm -hmm. right? And monopolies stop being capitalists. Right, because, right? because then they monopolies. can set the price. Yeah, yeah so, so uh, you know, there's got to be some way to prevent monopolies from breaking capitalism. But there, what we seem to have done is a poor job of keeping the regulatory bloat from also choking capitalism. And, and now it's created a whole new set of problems in our economy. It has. It has. So do you want to talk about these? I do. I knew it, right? And here we are already long on this segment. Let's do this. We'll grab this break. All right, gang. Yes, with awesome music. We are back. Uh, welcome back to the True Wealth Radio Show. Uh, I'm your host, Dave Littlejohn. Today hey. in studio. Matt Dixon. Uh, we, uh, we're having, I'm amazed how fast the show is flying by. The, the, the uh. premise started with, right, hey, how do folks get ahead today? And it was kind of geared toward the younger generation. And I guess you've gone have down we a rabbit hole. That at all? Well, we're explaining a lot of stuff. Let's, let me answer the question as best I can, or you can take a stab here. Yeah. Uh, it starts with, you, you really need to try to buy assets more than liabilities, right? And, and this yeah. is the thing. Higher net worth folks buy assets and lower net worth folks buy products. Right. Right? There's now, can an asset difference. be a product? Sure. The problem is a lot of people will rationalize that it's a product to try to go own it. Right? Like that stereo is uh, an investment in my entertainment, right? Like, all right, whatever you I say, dude. You're going to buy it because you want to. People struggle to classify the asset versus the liability. And I think a lot of people get that backwards or they get it yeah. mixed up. Well, here's a simple way to think about it. Can I buy something that will retain value such that I could sell it in the future for more than I paid for it? Yep. Okay. It's a really simple definition. If it doesn't have value later, it doesn't mean you don't need it. Like, you got to eat. Right. Mm -hmm. It's an investment in not dying. Right. But the food isn't going to appreciate with time. It's probably going to decay to zero. 
Yeah. So it's consumable. And there are things in our lives that are part of life is consumable. Okay. Right. But your couch. Your couch is a consumable. It's yeah, gonna your get car warm. largely, yeah. you know, those things wear out. Um, your home properly maintained should hold value. Mm-hmm. If they don't, they're not supposed to be big investments. They're supposed to retain value while you're using the asset. And we've had kind of unusual circumstance where things have gone up a great deal. Right. This, by the way, is the cornerstone of understanding that I think all of our listeners, and especially if you're trying to teach the next generation, latch onto this. Okay. And that is consider how much assets have increased in price right? The house that somebody could have built and and purchased in the 1940s for $3,500 that's today worth one and a half million dollars in California. Mm -hmm. Okay. What happened? Why is that asset so radically expensive compared to its original build cost? One thing, they're not making more land. Right. So there's scarcity. Yeah. Right. We have radically increased the number of dollars in circulation. That's a big one. Radically. Okay. Yeah. And you can see this with federal debt in particular, right? We have more money in existence and the federal government owes owes more money than at any point in history. Like, here's a staggering thing. We just, we, we looked at before the show, we looked at just how much money's been sent to Ukraine in the last like three years. Yeah, not one billion dollars, not five billion dollars. No. <laughs> it was close to a hundred and eighty billion dollars ish that we could calculate, and we estimated that based on the U.S. population as of census end of twenty twenty two, actually, that that was five hundred and forty six dollars for every man, woman, and child of any age, working status or not, in the United States. Just write right? that check and just send and it off. And by the way, not one of those dollars existed. Every one of them has been printed or conjured by the federal government. Right. Okay. So if you continue to increase the money supply like this. You just dilute your own currency. Yeah. You dilute the, dilute the currency. And what does that mean? Assets, we're not creating more. You said it, Matt. Right. But now they have to reprice. They have to reprice. Because there's more money in circulation. Correct. Sa- more dollars chasing the same amount of goods is inflationary in nature. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so government is stimulative when it spends economically, but it also contributes toward inflation in many cases. Okay. Now, tack on top of the, the fact that the government was spending at its all-time highs while interest rates were at all-time lows. What also happens? The, the consumer can borrow all the max amount. What does that mean? Big bad banks make lots of cheap loans, which puts tons of money in circulation, which does what? Drives up the price of assets. Well, it makes sense. If you can go get a mortgage at 2%, you can buy a lot of house. Right. Well, compared to today, sure. Yeah. But here's the really interesting thing. Prices have not come down appreciably compared to the nope. change in rate. Why is that? Demand. And yeah, scarcity, not enough houses. Right. What is part of why we don't have enough houses? Because of all the red tape that it takes to get into a house. Government, there's the the free-ish capitalist market, the Mm -hmm. ish. They want all the permitting fees. All the fees, yes. The, the, The extraordinary amount. And it's not just the government saying, here's the permitting process, right? The building materials that go into it. Think about the additional red tape that's gone into the harvesting and manufacturing of lumber product. Mm -hmm. Okay. Significant increases in environmental regulation. Again, not a commentary if it's good, bad, or otherwise. The input costs have all escalated. Also, the labor cost has escalated. The Fuel. fuel cost. Fuel. Right? All of these things get compounded. So every time that you see more administrative layers or more regulatory intervention, it drives the price higher. Mm-hmm. And what does that mean? Well, the government's going to spend whatever it wants to because it can print money. Mm-hmm. Okay. And when the government was in trouble and needed to stimulate the economy, what did it do? It lowered rates or it encouraged lower rates so that more money was available from banks. Yeah. I mean, it's great, right? right? Like, And when you- banks got in trouble, what did the government do? Bail them out. It gave printed money and gave it to the banks to fix it, right? Mm-hmm. So 
when the economy was really strong, what did the government do? Oh, it clearly rained in its spending to save for a rainy day. Said nobody ever, right? It spent even more, right? Right? And we can watch since, I mean, we can go back to pre-Clinton administration, say from, from after Reagan, George H.W. spent more, Bill Clinton spent more than him, and then George W. spent more than Clinton, Obama spent more than George, right? And then we had Trump spent more than Obama, I think in four years, and Obama had eight. Biden said, hold my beer, he spent more than everybody, right? And, and there's no sign of it stopping. No. Right? So you can't buy votes if you're not. Well, <laughs> I, you went there, I didn't, right? I wasn't, it's not about buying votes, it's about- Part of it is. There's, well, everybody in office, there's no reason they, not to. Well, exactly, they're incentivized to do it. Right, there's no reason not to. Your constituents expect it, so what do we do? We keep printing money. What does this do though? It has made everything radically unaffordable. So what do you do in this environment? Buy assets. You have to buy assets. Because the assets are what is repricing. And, the, you know, we've right. seen it. The middle class is owning less and less assets, if you look at the numbers. Right. Now, here's the terrifying thing. I'm going to give you advice that is something I don't actually want you to do. Whoa. Yeah. How can you do that? Well, I'm going to tell you how the system rewards people, but then I'm going to tell you why I think it's a bad idea. Okay. But Let's do first, it. we're going to take... You can't do that. I you do. Totally take our last break. Okay. All right. We're back for the home stretch where we are giving... Welcome to the True Wealth Show. If you're just joining us, uh, we're about to give really dangerous, not actual advice. Like, I'm not going to tell you to do it, but we're going to tell you uh, how do people get ahead in an economy where you have uh, high inflation and you have high interest rates. So um, what do you do, Matt? Well, we said it earlier, right before we clipped out of here, buying assets. So now the question is, what are those assets that you buy? Right. And how do you do it? So the answer really is um, you have to take on a lot of risk, okay? And, and this is, is this what you were saying? I'm not really advising this. I'm really not yeah. advising this, right? This is going to be antithetical to like what Dave Ramsey would say. He'd say like, debt is dumb, just pay everything off. And while he's not wrong, uh, like I don't like unsecured debt for example. But here's here's the thing. If assets, you need assets that are appreciating faster than the cost to carry the asset. So what usually is that? Okay. Again, disclosure, disclosure, disclosure. Not I am not offering advice, nor am I making a recommendation you do this. But let me tell you how the ultra wealthy people build tons of wealth. Okay. Let's use um, Elon Musk as an example. Bunch of Tesla stock, right? So what does Elon do? Shows up at a bank, pledges his Tesla stock as collateral, takes a big loan out. Then goes and buys a big piece of real estate somewhere, or another company for that matter. But let's say he goes and buys a $100 million mansion. It's not a residence, but he's able to start depreciating that asset, right? He's got another asset. His Tesla stock he still owns, it's appreciating still, and what he has to do is pay the debt service on his loan. So let's say he's getting charged 5%. So yes, but what happens now? He owns two assets. And the assets are appreciating at 10%. Yeah, I mean, maybe. But all, oftentimes what happens is you will depreciate an asset and you will use the depreciation to cancel other income. So if he's got depreciation, he can cancel out other pass like passive losses can can cancel out uh, passive income, right? And so he will lower his tax exposure, sell the real estate later and use some kind of uh, what we call 1031 exchange to buy an even bigger place or multiple places. Repeat the process all over again. Still owns his Tesla stock and now owns twice as many assets and is still just paying the debt service on the loan to continue to build this thing up. Instead of like an income. Instead of, and so yeah. he has zero income. Right. Right, but he owns a whole bunch of assets, all of which he can then, like if, if he buys an apartment complex, the apartment complex doubles in value, he could do a cash out refi, take all the cash out, not report his income, he's got that cash available in his pocket to buy more assets or pay for his lifestyle, and the cash flow from the apartments continues to pay off the loan that he has, mm -hmm. and he can 
also write off the capital depreciation against the income. That's the game that the ultra-wealthy plays. They layer into different tax structures. Hmm. Okay? So, super frustrating when you go, well, great. How the heck am I supposed to reach that? Well, what I, I keep telling people, one of the things that you need to do in order to navigate the changing in, in a workplace environment is to become more entrepreneurial. This doesn't mean that you have to be an entrepreneur uh, and start your own business, right? Okay. But it does mean that you need to find businesses that you can operate within that incentivize you to be an entrepreneur within that business, right? Mm, where like your interests are aligned. Yes. So, Matt, I'm pretty sure you know what I'm talking about on this one. Yeah, I mean, an employer who's giving you an opportunity to also earn more as the business earns more. And there's a lot of different ways that that can be done. But you're basically just trying to say, hey, you can't have a fixed ceiling. You want you know, that employee to be able to take the next step higher and then the next step higher from there where they're not just on the treadmill. Right. So here's the key for a lot of young folks in particular. Uh, I think that the advice, the advice that's been handed down for generations is needs to evolve. Right, because you know, the advice was save money, save money, and you'll be okay and work yeah. hard. Save money, work hard, you know, go to college right. and all that stuff. It's and just, now it's it'll like, just yeah. make, it'll make it work, right? College is now a barrier to entry for certain professions. But for the most part, college is just a really large expense. We're seeing people come out of college with $100,000 of debt and then a job that pays $80,000 a year. And you're like, okay, by the time you try and buy a house and pay off your college debt, you're going to be 60. Right. Well, and if you consider that you're going to go to college and then go into a job that there's not a lot of scarcity or a lot of demand, Ooh, even worse, then you're going to end up not being paid real well. So you end up with lots of debt and a low income to, to match it. So you need to view education as an investment in yourself and your earning capacity. It needs to right. open doors, not close them. Right. Okay? Well, and so that's that's new for people. That didn't used to be the case. It used to be if you went hey, to college, you could count on making more money. I can sneak another good stat in here for Already. you. Already. So since like 1997, I think, you look at the average hourly wage you know, growth of college graduates, mm -hmm. it's been falling since 2000 as a percentage, right? And so we're not seeing more pay. We're seeing less. Right. So hence, hence my statement that college is not a guarantee no. that it will produce superior value. It, it needs to be viewed as an investment. And so what I encourage people to invest in is the right education and skill set to be marketable in the in the workforce. And keep in mind that I'm not hating on McDonald's for this one, but where they get picked on a lot, which is that's a job that's really, really regimented. So anybody can do it. It's very entry level. And so they have their processes. You go and you follow the recipe and you do it their way. So because that's available to virtually anybody, it's not going to be highly compensated. Why? Because there's a huge supply of labor and not that many jobs for it. So you don't have to pay up. But if you increase your skill set and the things that make you in demand in the marketplace, that's how you get compensated better. And then if you bring that skill set to the work, the work environment and you add value by increasing revenue or helping other people increase revenue, right? Sometimes the job is right. supporting the revenue generation, not direct revenue generation. But you do that, then the company recognizes your value and they are able to pay you more. Right, So you want to be in a culture that operates that way. They align incentives so that you working harder means something rather than you working harder means the shareholder is the only beneficiary. Right. Okay. So anyway, that's, I think, the, the fastest summary I can make for how does one uh, attempt to get a toehold in today in a world where I will acknowledge it is much more expensive today than it, it was in years past. And I think it's just the slippage that comes with a lot more regulations over a long enough period of time and a bunch of people trying to address a symptom rather than the root cause of the problem. It could be very well intended, but the compounding effect of bad policy over time is the opposite of the compounding effect of money over time. Right. Right. And so it's, it eats away. It makes it harder. Um, so as we run out of time on the show today, here's what I would encourage you to do. You want to you know, invest early and often? Increase your skill set, 
make sure that you become more marketable in the workforce. Buy assets. Not buy assets. assets. Yeah. And, um, you know, become more entrepreneurial uh, to include starting your own business. If you are interested in learning more about this, continue to follow uh, our channel, our podcast, or you can give us a call. How do they reach us, Matt? 541-375-0898. Or you can go to our website at littlejohnfs, as in financialservices.com. All right. Well, as you can tell by the music, it's our time to rock and roll. So uh, thank you, as always, for tuning in. Uh, until next time, I'm Dave Littlejohn. And Matt Dixon. And you've been listening to True Wealth on News Radio 93.9 FM at 1240 KQEN.